Good morning, this is Pastor Barbara. This is our second video for this morning. Today is September 13th, 2015. And uh, we're going to begin. It's, um, we're about an hour into our program. And we've been playing around with um, viewing. And I'm not, I think I can maybe get us a little bit better picture there. Uh, we've been um, looking at videos of Sander von Martin, Marion and uh, Diane Bish. He is Dutch, she is American from Florida. Two of the world's living greatest organists and been doing, I they both made many videos on this same organ. And apparently, the one I just showed you was not the one I taped last night. Uh, but tonight, uh, at our program, the beginning of the program, you'll see what it takes to get the air into those pipes. Um, for those that, that got my video, You'll notice uh, I gave you some pictures. Um, all but one had to do with the subject of depression and sadness and thoughts of or attempts of suicide. But there was one of an organ. And unlike most organs, you see an organ bench. Now, you see behind me, <laughs> on my organ, you see a bench. You don't see a chair. But on these old, old, old pump organs, you saw only a chair. Because what the organist did with their feet was pump air into tubes. And I don't have it to show it to you on this video or in this live lesson. Um, but uh, it's, to me, it was complicated. As a musician, 2 4, 4 4, or 2 6, uh, I could play on it. I could not play a waltz on it because I could not make my feet go one, two, one, two, one, two, and the music go one, two, three, one, two, three. This old gal never was able to do that. But that's why you had a chair. And if you look uh, on, the, on the video, on the um, picture that I emailed you, you'll see that at the bottom of the organ, you see two triangles or something shaped like this, and you put your foot on it, and you press on it, and that's what that is. Getting air into pipes that are scattered all over, and this new video, they don't make this kind of organ anymore because to do something electronically, you can get more sounds a whole lot more cheaper. And you don't need a whole big building to do it. But my friend Zach says that, um, well, in fact, I have some videos of the, it is one of the latter. There's been another organ built, built since, and maybe two since then. But um, you can just do so much, much more ex inexpensively with electronics than you can the old-fashioned way. Uh, and now we have machines that will pump um, air into those pipes. But the way they did it, five, six, 700 years ago was totally different. All right, let's talk about our subject for tonight. If you ask somebody why they, 
it, that's right. It's like a sewing machine pedal. And um, except it is pushing air into pipes. And you're dealing with a rather small organ. Uh, and the pipes are usually contained in the back of the organ, so you could actually move the organ from this side of the church to that side of the church because the pipes are all contained in, in one thing. Um, basically, what you have is your organ that you see that you play. It's like your dashboard. It is only where you sit and where you control things. Uh, the actual mechanism is all over the church. If you ask somebody why they want to commit, um, or why they want to take their life or commit suicide, you usually get language of life isn't worth living anymore. And when you try to figure out why that person feels that their life isn't worth living, you know, we all have different ideas about what our ideal life would be like. And you've seen kids in stores and in public places pitch a fit because they can't have something they want. And the parent, in order to not be embarrassed by their kid laying on the floor, kicking, screaming, very often give in and give the kid what the kid wants. Many children have gone through life and they have never been denied something they want. Unless, of course, it was just something that would kill them. I mean, we don't let children play in the street. Uh, we don't let them drink uh, an unknown liquid from an unknown container, but we do allow children to have what they want because we don't want them to embarrass us. There are younger people who have never hurt Their parents have protected them so well from pain, from everything unpleasant, that we have whole bunches of people that don't know how to deal with, number one, wanting something they can't have, two, suffering something their parents can't make go away. Going through something that causes them deep pain. You know that the death of your child's pet hamster is preparing your children for the death of the family dog or the family horse, depending what part of the country you live in. And that is preparing them for the death of their grandparents, who usually pass away before the parents do and who they usually don't see with the same frequency that they see their parents. And very often it's these little things that prepare us for the bigger things. 
I woke up the other morning and I felt great. It was about six o'clock in the morning. And I have neuropathy, which wakes you up in the night. And sometimes you lose half hour sleep, sometimes you lose three or four hours sleep, and you may sleep in in the morning. And um, you usually wake up and something hurts. And I thought, oh, nothing hurts. I feel great. And I thought, I wonder what percentage of Americans woke up this morning and they were not in pain. I imagine probably around 75%. That's a lot of people. But I wonder how many of those people realized, hey, Nothing hurts. This is great. Nothing hurts. As people get older, more and more things quit working. It's like driving a 20-year-old car. When one thing is working, something else isn't. And you're almost forced to buy um, a new car because what you fix this week, something else will break down next week. And paying the larger payment of a new car is cheaper than paying the unknown payment every two or three weeks if you're not a mechanic and you can't do it yourself of getting an older car going. But in our day and age, a lot of people have never hurt. They've never been hurt. Consequently, they don't know how to deal with pain. The EMT says, okay, we're going to get you to the ER and the doctor will deal with your pain. Very often the doctor cannot deal with your pain as soon as you go into the ER because there's things they must do first and they must know first. But most of us just want the hurt to go away. We want the pain to go away. If you ask people, why do you want to end it? What is so bad about your life that the unknown seems better to you than the known? And it is usually, I'm depressed, and one of the first things that as a minister I have to determine is are you depressed or are you sad? Because if you're depressed, that is a medical as well as a feeling problem. And that requires uh, the assistance of another type of professional. Very often, they're not depressed, but they're sad. Okay. Sad for 30 minutes before you go to bed at night is one thing. Sad all night long so you can't sleep 
is something else. Sad all day, all night can be more than what some people can handle. So we go to what makes you sad. You know, it's not unusual that when something is going on with somebody else, we can see it and we can understand it. But when it goes on with us, we don't. We know we've got a problem, but we can't fix it. If it was somebody else's problem, we could tell them how to fix their problem. But we can't recognize the problem when it's ours. And we don't know how to fix it. And when somebody gives us instructions, we can't understand them. I had the same thing happen to me in court. I had worked for a number of years in the court system. I could give other people advice. I had acted as amicus curiae, a friend of the court, in some circumstances where somebody felt they would get, and this is not correct, but they felt they would get more for their money if they paid for an interpreter who worked in the court system, as opposed to paying the same amount of money to an interpreter. And then, uh, I'm sorry, to uh, an attorney. And they just leaving it in their hands. And I do very well at telling other people how to testify and how to behave. <laughs> when it's you, it's totally different. What do you mean? You're an adult. You don't understand the words I just told you? No. When it's us, it's totally different. Usually, when people are trying to determine what makes them so sad, they will be willing to pull the plug. They will tell you it's other people. It might be the whole family. They may feel the whole family is against them. For children, it might be the whole school or the whole class. If you sit in a class for five or six hours a day, that's your world. And when you have to spend five or six hours a day in a place where you feel nobody likes you and everybody is against you, that's a long time. If it's not you, and you're looking at somebody else, you might say, yeah, but you go home, you have your friends, you have your friends. It's one thing when it's somebody else. It's something different when it's you. That five or six hours a day becomes an eternity. When it's somebody else that's suffering, you see it totally different. There's one thing that everybody wants us to do, and that's change other people. If you could make my kids appreciate me, I drive an hour to work. I work eight and a half hours because I've got a half hour for lunch. I drive another half hour or another hour home. I come in, I'm dead tired. 
I walk in the door and I deal with what everybody else, what they want. I don't even get to sit down and have a cup of coffee till everybody wants something from me and nobody loves me for me. They just love me for what they can get and I'm tired and my back hurts. And things did not go so well at work today. The wife says she thinks I can do nothing. <laughs> she thinks I've had such a great day. She does not feel his pain. And because her work has been in the family home, if, if that's the case, because in many cases, we've got two people working and in some cases, we've got two people holding down three or four jobs. We see what bothers us. And we figure the way to stop our pain is to get other people to not cause us pain. So if we can make the kids at school not make fun of me, or if the teacher could make the kids like me, Wait a minute. Make someone else like you. Talk about impossibilities. I was a very good teacher the 11 years, well, I, 12 years I taught public school. I taught in one place 11 years. And I, when I was 19, I taught school for a year in Missouri. Because I was driving through, I stopped to say hi to my grandparents. And uh, the music teacher got transferred, and I worked there for a year. But even a good teacher can't make somebody like somebody else, and you can't make other people behave in a way that's not natural for them. So how do we stop the pain? And how can we go through a normal day so that things, and I don't care whether it's somebody doesn't like you. I don't care if every uh, part of your spine is not working and your back hurts. It doesn't make any difference what the pain is. It can be physical pain. It can be confusion. It can be mental pain. It can be emotional pain. It can be pain that doesn't even exist. But if you think you got it, and if you think it hurts, then you hurt. So how do we take away the pain, regardless of what kind of pain it is? And this is something about older people. If you have grown older normally, if you have maybe broken a leg, maybe had someone in your family die before you were 15, Maybe little by little you caught on, ooh, this hurts. But 
other people are dealing with it, so I guess I can. And if you learn about pain, little by little, you learn to deal with it, little by little. So that by the time you're in your 40s or 50s and you have high blood pressure, it's not that big of a deal. And then the doctor says, oh, by the way, you have something that you're going to have to learn to live with. Uh, it's not going to kill you. It'll be uncomfortable. We'll give you a pill and we'll do the best we can, but you're going to have it the rest of your life. And you say, oh, well, okay. You dealt with the death of a German shepherd. You dealt with the death of your grandparents. You sprained your right ankle. And it's still bigger than your left ankle, and there's things you can't do, but it didn't kill you. And you've got a fairly normal life. And as you get older, and you get more and more and more of these things that are uncomfortable and get hurt, whether it's physical, or whether it's emotional, or whether it's mental, whether it's real or perceived. You know, a lot of people are ready to cash in their chips, and there's nothing the matter with them. But if they think there is, it hurts just as bad. Let me prove it to you. I'll prove it to you with something that happened, a couple of things that happened a few years ago here. Um, but let me talk to you about bears and about the human body and about your mind and about your emotions. Let's say I look out, I'm downstairs, and I have, I have stairs that go from the ground to my second story. And there's a deck out there, and there's a, just like there are sliding glass doors here, there are sliding glass doors in the room right under this room. Let's say I'm downstairs in the bird room, and I look out, and across the street I see a bear. Now, we haven't had bears for a while. Um, I could put my trash out on Tuesday night, and Wednesday morning, uh, they have a, a special service here for people that are handicapped. Um, I would have to take my trash down, put it in the car, drive out to the access road, take the access road down to the main road, unload my car, and put my trash um, it used to be we all put our trash in our car and took it to the dump. That's light if you lived on the mountain, but then they changed it. Well, that changing was fine for some people. But if you lived on an access road like I did, and if putting things in and out of your car and moving them around we said, look, if I have to put them in my car, might as well take it to the dump, not take it down and unload it myself, and then pay some guy to drive it and put it in some other truck. So they called me and said that they had a new program, that I have a handicap tracker. And I said, yeah, but send us a picture of it. And they send somebody who picks up right from my door. Um, so I just have to put trash right outside my door. When I first moved up here, I couldn't do that. First of all, the bears knew <laughs> what day whose trash got picked up. And there would be trash scattered all over the place. 
I didn't really have breakfast except one half of a cookie, so I'm going to have my combination chocolate coffee. Let's see if that takes away the hunger. Um, and we also had coyotes, which we don't have. And we also had a lot of squirrels all over the deck. I had a squirrel, a squirrel. I had a family of squirrels that come straight up the house to this deck. We don't have them anymore. We've got some little, I, I don't know, you know, things change. Um, when you no longer have the same kind of tree that produces the same acorns that this kind of animal likes, that kind of animal goes to live somewhere else. So we don't have the same animals here that we did, but we used to have bears. Uh, coyotes are scary, especially if they're hungry, but they're smaller. And if you can get on the other side and close the door, you're okay. Bears are something different. A door, a window is not a problem for a bear. Now, if I were to go down in the bird room, let's say, 12 years ago, when we had a lot of coyotes and a lot of bears, and not seen a bear. Came up here, sat at the computer. If I heard a noise, and I looked at the stairs, and I saw a shadow the size of the bear. Knowing that there had been one out there, and that there are stairs that go up to my downstairs uh, part of the house, seeing the shadow, hearing a sound on the stairs, my heart rate will double, guaranteed. My blood pressure will be 180 over 110. All kind of, I'll be scared to death. I might be too scared to pick up the phone and dial 911. My brain and my body will undergo all kinds of changes. And the light goes on, and it's not a bear. See, it doesn't take a bear to raise my blood pressure. All it takes is for me to believe there's a problem. Then you have to be a sickness. The doctor picks up the wrong chart. He says, oh, it looks like you've got cancer and we're not sure if you can get it all. It doesn't make any difference whether the doctor is right or wrong. You undergo an enormous experience with pain and fear. He's looking at the wrong guy's chart. Doesn't make any difference. Um, I always, I don't know that the word prided myself is the right word to use, but that because of my faith, I didn't suffer things that other people suffered because I didn't go through fear that other people went through. And then one night I happened to come out of my uh, bedroom door. While I was still in my bedroom, I heard a car rushing up the access road. It's a steep road. And um, older cars, like cars that don't have very powerful engines, sometimes battle with it, and you can hear it. 
by the time I got to the door and looked through the cathedral windows, you're, you're looking through them um, right there. Well, the lower part of them. And I saw that car turn and come toward my house. Well, these cathedral windows are very narrow. And you have to be right in front to see out. The only place up here that I can really see what's going on in front of my house is to look out my kitchen window. So I go through the living room and dining room and into the kitchen. And by this time, the car is headed for the house. Now, you can't get to the house because there's a parking deck. And it's like a deck in a, in a mall. If you get to the end, you go down. You couldn't get in my house with this car. It's a physical possibility. But I'm standing in front of my kitchen sink looking out the window. Now, this must have been one of those new little cars because if you park just right, you can park three cars in my deck. But I never have need to park three cars, so I usually park where you can get two cars in. But that day, I just pulled up right in the middle of the deck. And there would have been no way to get a normal sized car on either side of me. And like I said, he would have driven off and tumbled down the mountain before he could have driven into my house. That didn't make any difference to me. I'm standing there looking outside. My blood pressure is just like all over the place. And I'm disappointed in myself. I'm saying, where is my faith? Why does my faith not protect me from having my blood pressure go up? And I called my medical group, has a place you can call if you need advice uh, in the middle of the night. Um, and I said, you know, I took my regular blood pressure medicine, but now it's way up there. Do I take my blood pressure medicine again or don't I? I have learned, at least in my case, there can be absolutely nothing wrong, but if you think there's something wrong, you will suffer as much pain as if there is something wrong. Maybe people don't hate you, but if you think they do, you will suffer the same as if they do. Okay, I announced that I would talk about you can't change other people. If you ask most people, you better keep track of the time here. You ask most people, what would have to happen for you to be happy? What would have to happen for you to not be afraid? For you not to feel that the world was against you. For you not to fear that you're going to wake up in the morning with some terrible disease. I have yet to talk to anybody. I've been around a long time. I talked to a lot of people. 
I have yet to talk to anybody that feels they can make a change and fix things. Everybody's solution for their pain is for other people to change. Well, if my wife would appreciate me, if she would see that I drive a half hour to work, that I'm there eight and a half hours, another half hour back, and I come back, I've been on my feet all day, and I've been dealing with people that I can't stand, couldn't she just hand me a diet soda when I walk in the door? Or these kids think I'm made out of money? They see that the other kids all have an iPhone. They think I'm made of money. They want to have what the other kids have. I'm the one that has to take my paycheck. And I have to take the water bill, the gas bill, the electric bill the rent or the house payment or the insurance. And I've got to make this money pay for all those bills. Why don't the kids change their attitude about thinking they got to have an iPhone because everybody else has got an iPhone, which is somehow better than a droid. If my boss would change, it doesn't make any difference who we're talking about. Let me tell you something about life. The pain is what you perceive it to be. Not what it is. Whether it's a bear or whether it's a shadow. Whether the kids are only interested in their wants and they don't even appreciate what you do to bring in the cash. The problem is not other people. The problem is, is it a bear or is it a shadow? It's how you deal with other people, not them. Number one, you can't change them. You can't make anybody love you. If I had money, or I told you I have a friend who's an actress, she has other friends who are in the industry. I could get somebody to go into your house and say the right things and do the right things, I could pay them. It's possible to give somebody money to live in your house and say, stay in bed, dear. I'll fry the eggs and make the pancakes and turn the bacon and I'll bring you breakfast in bed. You can pay somebody to say and do certain things. 
And some people will do anything for money. But you can't buy love. And you can't, oh, you can get people to say, I love you. And some people are very good at figuring out how to do things to get what they want. But you can't make people love you. You can't make people have feelings for you they don't have. So what can you do? You can take control of yourself. And there isn't a person alive. Listen, this is important. There isn't a person alive that can hurt my feelings unless I let them. A stranger can knock at my door and I can open the door and they can say, you're the ugliest woman I've ever seen. <laughs> That's exactly what would happen. I would laugh in their face. Because I'm not going to let some person I don't know and I've never seen and have no clue who they are, say something that's going to upset me, why would I get upset by some stranger coming and doing something ridiculous? I'd laugh in their face because I don't accept. You say I'm the ugliest woman alive. I don't accept that. So I can laugh at you. I can smile at you. Because I have determined who I am. And I have determined that the thoughts and the actions of strangers mean absolutely nothing to me. But, what about the actions and the words of the people you care for? Mm. Yeah. A dear friend, a relative, family, they can say something that will hurt. But, and you can't change it. If it's a sibling, a brother or a sister, and the parent comes in and say, don't you ever say that again, don't you ever do that again. Oh, it's possible that your sister, your brother will never say it again, never do it again, but you know that it's there. How do you fix it? You don't fix them. You fix you. You understand who you are. Fulfill the purpose that you have for being on this earth. God made us to have fellowship with him. He created angels for service. Go carry this message. Go fight this battle. Go protect this person. He created human beings for fellowship. 
we were meant to be a friend of God. We were meant to love him. We were meant to receive and accept his love for us. We were created so that we could enjoy God and he could enjoy us. Now, if you want to make the world revolve around whether the neighbor speaks to you or not, that's your business. I can tell you it's silly, but that's your business. What do you need to be happy? It may not be what you want. And that's our problem, especially in this country. We have a lot of wants. Our needs aren't that great. I don't need banana splits every day. I need food every day. I want banana splits or ice cream sundaes and chocolate cake. I want it every day. I don't need it every day, and it's not good for me every day. And if I didn't have it, if I went and I don't have it every day, I'm better off. We have to separate our wants from our needs. It doesn't make any difference if your neighbors love you or not. Unless it makes a difference to you. Um, I, I see some activity on my screen and I don't understand it because I've got a, a chat board and I've got names that are showing up in one part of my screen, not on the other. But anyway, Carolyn, anyway. Okay. Now, if you have to get along with your neighbors or commit suicide, you've got a problem. Because I or nobody else can make your neighbors treat you like you want to be treated. You cannot change other people, but you can change you. And the beginning of it is, for the people who are hearing this for the very first time, the very beginning of this is accepting Christ as the forgiver of your sins so you're not carrying this burden around. And you begin to fulfill what you were put on earth to do, which is have fellowship with God. That's just the very beginning. It's not all of it. And let me tell you, it doesn't happen overnight. But you can make a beginning. But if other people are responsible for your pain, um, then there's nothing we can do about it because I can't change other people. And as much as you want a certain person to love you, if they don't, You're going to have to change what you want. You say, but I want John Doe to love me. 
and I want John Doe to give me gifts. And I want John Doe to tell me that I'm the only woman in the world for him. And John Doe says, are you kidding? Her? And no way. We can't fix what you want. But we can help you understand what you need. And this is a process. This isn't something that happens at five minutes to 12. And at 12, it's done. This is something that begins now. It ends by saying, that's true. There are things I want that I'm not going to have. But trust me, there are other people out there besides John Doe. I know a lot of young women who would love to be married. They want somebody making a hundred thousand a year, drives a Lexus. Uh, come on. Some of those guys aren't worth going to McDonald's with for dinner. We've got to get our thinking squared away. These same young women don't look like Sophia Loren either. We have to be realistic. You cannot change. You can't change your spouse. You can change your expectations of your spouse. And who knows? If you start being satisfied with a spouse that up till now has been inadequate in your thinking, maybe they will start seeing you differently. So you have to adjust your wants to what is realistic. And no, for those of you who have maybe only walked with the Lord for five years or a year, or maybe you're not safe, believe me, there is a life which is so satisfying and so fulfilling and so happy that you wonder why? What was my? Why didn't I see this before? Why was I looking for something I thought I had to have? When something else is bringing me great satisfaction, and it was available to me all the time, that I was just looking for 
something else or someone else or you can't change other people. You can change what you want. And you, if you wanted something for a long time, it may take a little work on your part to say, okay, I guess you're right. I can't make that person love me. Or I can't make that person do what I want that person to do. Therefore, I will expect less of that person. But I will look for something that I can have and that I should have. And that God created me to have. And it's about two minutes to twelve. And this is a good place to end. Probably next Sunday morning. We'll talk more specifically about what we should expect or not expect out of other people. And how we cope with determining what we think is happy. It didn't need to change. But you didn't think you got everything in life you wanted, did you? You know, I don't live on the other side of the lake. I live where I live. I can sit here and want a $5 million home. But I'm just as happy and probably more happy than many people who are living in the five to ten million dollar homes. Walk or two closer to the lake than me. Your happiness is not in other people. It's in your expectation. And we have a lot of preachers who say a lot of things in order to fill up a big building with a lot of people. You have to say things that people like to hear. And so we have a lot of people talking about prosperity. Oh, yeah, I want that. Perfect. Yeah, I want that. Some of these things are not realistic. They bring people back to your church every couple of Sundays. But it's not realistic. It's not stuff they preached when I was a kid. God wants you to prosper. Of course he does. But what is prosperity? Ten million in the bank and cancer in your liver. We have to consider what God made us for. What God's plan for us is. And what makes us happy. So to conclude, and it's a little difficult, we began being featured again two minutes ago, and I'm closing. So it's <laughs> a little difficult. So let me repeat. It isn't necessarily what happens that causes you pain, but what you perceive. And if you think a bear is coming up those stairs, your blood pressure will rise. If that bear is a shadow and a neighbor dropping something, making a horrible noise, your body, your mind, your psyche 
will react on what you perceive is coming up the stairs. And it may not be a problem at all. And remember, if your happiness is having certain things, or having certain people love you, or certain people treat you a certain way, you may not enjoy that happiness. There's, there's no guarantee how other people are going to react. You can pay somebody to go through the motions and say the right thing. If it comes to time when the music changes, then on the screen it says the end. Come back and see it again tomorrow night. And the movie is over with, and real life begins. So, if any of you have things during the week you want me to address next Sunday morning, we'll probably be on this subject, and it comes from uh, within about a three-week period, we had four people, uh, some consider, some attempt, and some succeed at committing suicide all within my organization, Current Trades, in a short period of time. And in talking with them, first we determine, are you clinically depressed? In which case, you need another type of professional. Now, let me say one thing about that. Every once in a while, I run into a doctor that thinks MD means PhD, MIND, EDUCD, and they believe they're specialists in everything. And if they perceive you to be too religious. Oh, that's your problem. You go to church too often and you listen to all this nonsense. Wait a minute. Am I telling you what to give your patients for high blood pressure? Am I telling you what to give your patients for this symptom or the other? don't get in my field of expertise and I won't get in yours, but too many doctors, maybe too many is not the word, more than there should be, are doctors who, when it comes to your faith, If it doesn't coincide with their beliefs, think you'd be better off if you had more of doctors and less of God. And there are preachers that go the opposite, to go the same road also. Well, just give it to God. And uh, I have a hard time not expressing myself when I get around doctors that are that way. That I haven't. I guess I'm getting a reputation among them and I haven't found one for a while uh, that way. But in my younger days, uh, there were doctors, oh, you're one of them, well, that's your problem. And we were created to fellowship with God and for him to fellowship with us.
if you don't have that component in your life, that's one big spot you need to fill. Because we are not complete until that part of our life is dealt with satisfactorily. Give me just a moment, my life group, while I close out um, the video, and I'll be right back with you. Until our next video, I'll see you on you.